Akfara. I am a lecturer at the University of Nairobi's Institute of Diplomacy and International Studies. Um, I also had uh, a new local Somali think tank called National Research Academy, which is the research arm of the Justice and Peace Network, which is itself a global Somali political movement uh, across the world aiming to constructively contribute to uh, the long search for justice and lasting peace in Somalia. In other words, uh, it's, it's more of a civic movement that has been uh, working in fact uh, for about a year. Today is uh, and marks the first anniversary it was founded on October 13th last year. Mashallah. Um, I'm 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 based in Nairobi as a Nairobi-based Somali academic with long-term political ambitions. But for now, it's it's uh, my 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 mission is to work um, on on that search, regardless of whether we have to engage with the government or uh, non-Somali Somali as well as non-Somali non-state actors, but also with various uh, countries in the region and international community, including international organizations, on getting everything else that has to do with Somalia um, to be pushed and uh, matched with the national interest at uh, Mogadishu level. Um, in terms of um, going back historically, based on your research and your knowledge, how much of the, the political science has been uh, the daily life of the Somalis pre-colonial era? Within a span of a century and a half, as I earlier mentioned today in my lecture, um, there are two great British explorers, one of them more scholarly, the other one a bit colonialist, can debate and, and brand both of them colonialists. I wouldn't. Uh, one was Richard Patton, who wrote uh, The First Footsteps of East Africa, and the other one is Jan Lewis, uh, who also wrote extensively on Somalia and state the nation in the Horn of Africa, referring the Somalis that way. They both mentioned the Somalis as fierce republicans and pastoral democrats, respectively. Button calling the Somalis fierce republicans, Ian Lewis, pastoral democrats. And there is no one single to date, just like they were in pre-colonial colonial and independent Somalia, the different eras, there is no one single Somali clan, sub clan or sub sub clan that you cannot, in which you cannot see both traits. That one is both a fierce republican, who is no nonsense and is answerable, but to no other authority other than him or herself. In terms of negotiations and renegotiations and the various levels of diplomatic interaction and engagement, they are also pastoral democrats. So, political engagements, whether you want to call it action, or as a result of that reaction, or even as a result of both interactions, or you want to call it political science as a discipline. There was no one single era and period of history that Somalis were not involved in politics in one way or the other. When you talk about modern Somali history, I think we can uh, talk about the formation and emergence of the former Somali National University in Mogadishu in the 70s, and mainly from the early 80s with the introduction of a specific faculty for political science and journalism that they have been involved. But political engagements, it's, it's in the blood of the Somali. As a discipline, you can, you can bring it from uh, the 80s. Of course, people have been sent to various parts of the outside world, to mainly the West by the civilian administrations, and then later on to the East, and mainly to the East, Russia, Romania, uh, 
most of the Arab Muslim world by the military government in pre-1991 Somalia. Okay, now uh, coming back to um, colonial uh, era, um, how much of uh, understanding of the world has the pastor, uh, the, the, what did he call it, the uh, young Louis called the pastoral uh, democrats. democrats, how much of that d did it influence? Um, it did basically Britain or Italy or any other uh, uh, country did not just come to Somalia and start dealing with people. Pastoral democracy was practically seen in those interactions between Somalis and, and non Somali actors, either in the form of colonialism or uh, in uh, assimilation, in conquest, in migration. Uh, and more so in uh, intermarriage as well as trade uh, along the coastal lines of Somalia from um, Ras Asir all the way to Ras Gamboni. Um, you would see, if, if you go back to history and, and you look at some of those various agreements, although we don't endorse them in modern day Somali history, you will note that all those agreements came as a result of stiff negotiations between the traditional elders at the time and the various representatives of either the British government or the Italian government or the Turks, the Ottoman Empire or the Egyptians or the various private business elements coming from all parts of the world from India, the Indian subcontinent uh, to the Muslim Arab world and, and, and so on but the fierce republicanism was only practically seen either when Somalis had problems themselves they had to fight over uh, scarce war resources or pasture or women or uh, camels, animals in general but mainly you would see their unity and disunity when, when they had to fight colonialism and that that would have been their true color as fierce republicans. Okay, um, I would just wanted to ask you then in terms of um, obviously coming to the uh, turn of 19th century you have uh, Abdullah Hassan the dervishes and you've got in Sudan the, the Mahdist and, and, and you've got all over the place these religious figures who are fighting the, uh, uh, the colonials and then they, them coming up with their own uh, uh, modern political view, which is actually Islamic based. Um, how much did that actually influence in, in, in rebelling the colonial powers and on or understanding their uh, mindset? Um, in fact, uh, the dervish history um, gives us a very unique window of opportunity in terms of understanding uh, how anti-foreign Somalis have been historically and it's testimony to what's going on in, in various parts of Somalia um, to date. Um, it, it also shows um, the lack of political organization, political planning in terms of tactical, operational, strategic among the mainstream Somali politicians throughout history. Um, the dervish, Sayyid Muhammadullah Hassan, was one of those very uh, uh, sharp uh, Somali leaders who had some kind of a ideological program which was, although linked to actors outside Somalia was A in line with Islamic Sharia law and B was applicable to the Somali context and situation basically because uh, the Mahdi and himself and the Sudanese and the Somalis were but one belonged to one Ummah, Islam and the Muslims and the Muslim community. In that case he came uh, with Shah Muhammad Salah's thinking mainly the Salihiyya uh, sect within the mainstream uh, Shafi'iyya and his mission was to liberate Somalia from British 
uh, as well as uh, Italian and other colonialists this out of the country, including Ethiopian, by the way, colonialism in Ogaden, the reserve area, and Hout, which is still there, unfortunately. He came alone, and that's why I said, you know, his understanding how the dervish fought gives us a very unique window of opportunity that's worth repeating, if need be. And started uh, not only calling for jihad, but fighting with, first and foremost, with his stick, Bokorat, and then uh, standing up in the middle of the mosque and fighting and, and calling for jihad, and then go into the bush and began buying guns from uh, the members of the Somali community in the British army at the time, colonial army, one after the other, until he formed the biggest armed African rebel group, which forced British to use its air force to uh, defeat. So Sayyid Muhammad Abdullah Hassan came back to Somalia through Berbera as one single handedly and unarmed uh, rebel leader with that mentality, although he's used Islam, and ended up being the first armed group in Africa that Britain has used its air force to defeat. They're quite, quite historical. So Although connections with the Sudanese were there, it was and it was more ideological. Um, it was it, it it was worth doing because that was all about Islam, but but nothing that you can really call ideological when it comes to the various competing discourses that are going on in today's world. For example, communism versus capitalism, or democratization process versus and, and so on. Okay, and um, having understood that uh, and developed different thinking and uh, from various backgrounds and various political forces that were there at the day, um, going to the next stage of Somali revolution, we have that stage of uh, 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 again anti colonialism where uh, SOL is formed, uh, the youngsters are coming to the streets education is at the forefront people are reading newspapers that come from Cairo you know linking up with the Arab world and finding out that sort of mentality from from Cairo as well how much did that contribute to to the sort of mentality that Akhwan Muslimin had in, in Egypt at that time and what it linked how much did that link with Somalia because we know that contact of uh, information sharing, your daily information. You had two great ideological discourses in this part of the world, not, not in Europe where we are now, I'm talking about Africa, mainly uh, East, uh, West and North Africa together with the Middle East enclave. Uh, you had Pan-Africanism, which uh, was to emerge from and among the various uh, black African diaspora communities, mainly in North America, down to West Africa. You also had Pan-Arabism, pan which we also call Nasserism, because of Egypt's Nasser. Uh, both of them from the early 30s and 40s throughout the 50s. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah is, is uh, usually referred to as the father of Pan-Africanism in that context whereby in North Africa and the Middle East in Cliff you have uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser from Egypt. Um, it, it was not more of a religious inclination that put Somalia and Egypt together, it was more of the uh, political inclination of which um, uh, the Somalis in, in, in Somalia looked upon um, the Arabs for an inspiration for their um, push and struggle to liberate Somalia from, from foreign forces, among other issues. So SYL not only got training, uh, but also exposure and awakening the Somali conscious for the need to stand up for their rights and say no to the foreign, 
forces at that time, in other words, the colonialists. Um, so the Akhwan Muslimin aspect in terms of that religious inclination was a very tiny, uh, I think, a third kind of a fraction, if, if any. And you can bring it back in our discussions when you get to the 70s or 80s in Somali, modern Somali history, when we come to the military regime and, and then various factional fighting after that. Okay, and now coming to uh, the time of a um, short while after the, the, the achievement of what SYL regarded its own objectives as in the liberation of the country from the colonialism and having the uh, British Somaliland and the Italian Somaliland join together and form one government. Um, how, how much of that did you play in current conflict, today's conflict? How much of that uh, in, in, jo in the two unification. parts, unification, how much of the conflict did that have today? Well, first of all, I think uh, there are some terminologies I need to clarify, if not uh, define them clearly for for your audience. In English, it may not be uh, any major difference. In fact, one and the same when you say Republic of Somalia or the Somali Republic, but there are some political connotations uh, on the two. Um, soon after... Um, Italy took over the south and uh, Britain took over the north. They divided the country and, and called northeast as the Somaliland, British Protectorate of Somaliland. And in the south it was Italian Somaliland, which was put under UN trustee with Italy as, as uh, the guardian. Uh, and, and basically because there were, practically speaking, two republics, we called the south the Republic of Somalia, and that that was Mogadishu and and, and uh, uh, the northeastern enclave put together. Um, now the political connotation I'm talking about is when the unification uh, happened. Hargeisa got independence from Britain some four or five days before Mogadishu got its independence from uh, the Italians on July 1st, and then they came to reunify with the rest. And because the South was called the Republic of Somalia, the North Somaliland, uh, British Protectorate, they've agreed to reunify and then had to grapple with what they would call uh, the new Republic. And they said, why don't we call it the Somali Republic? If you call it Republic of Somalia or, Re or the Somali Republic, it's one and the same in English language, as the name, both names imply. But there's that political connotation upon the agreement of the two Somalis, the Northerners and the Southerners. However, because the reunification was rushed by the northerners and the southerners told them to go back and rethink about it and reflect upon and you know uh, do their calculations better and they said no um, pushed for the reunification right away but immediately after that there was some discontent about how business was run in Mogadishu a lot of uh, grievances and complaints by the northerners in terms of uh, discrimination against them. Um, you, you you remember that in the north there was some kind of uh, infrastructure, uh, political and administrative training by the British. Uh, the organization in terms of the Somali tradition leadership and so on. While in the south you had a mafia type kind of junior administrative training programs, but nothing beyond that other than uh, how to police uh, the Somalis, and, and, and basically that was it. And, and of course, uh, exploit their natural resources, the banana plantations, and so on. That can, in one way or the other, be explained as one of the contributions to that. But you can you can bring all kinds of uh, various root causes in terms of uh, what we have in today's Somalia. There was. Uh, colonial legacy, the divisive ro uh, policies by um, the British as well as the Italian colonial administrations before the 1960s. You also have um, um, Cold War 
politics and rivalry between the former USSR and the United States over the Horn of Africa and more so over Somalia and Ethiopia, over Ogaden, Haud and Reservaria. You have had the Ogaden war which led to the fragmentation of course as a result of the defeat uh, to the fragmentation of a former national army and the subsequent um, uh, civil war as a result of armed rebellion against uh, the late Ziad Barre. There was clan politics and rivalry. Uh, but throughout, I think, of, of the most important uh, root cause was uh, corruption, nepotism, as well as political and administrative inefficiencies practiced by all the various Somali governments and the colonialists before them. So the you know, the rushed reunification between Mogadishu and Hargeisa could be seen as one of the minor contributors to what's going on today. But there's a whole lot of other uh, causes on the menu, the list. Um, is it safe to say, uh, as it's been mentioned in various uh, platforms, whether there would be academic or uh, political analysis, that um, rushing out the regime of uh, Barre without considering it and, and, and planning what would replace is what contributed to the long-standing civil war that we have. That's a good question you've raised. If you have been, um, I'm sure you've read about history if you, if you uh, could not follow trends at the time. Throughout the late 80s, uh, there was a constitutional dispensation uh, going on in, in Somalia. Professor Jawari is one of the only two living uh, persons of those uh, members in the drafting committee of the 1989-90 Somali constitution, which was, I think, the secret behind that constitutional document was that it was a Somali version of the 1960 Somali constitution, which has been somehow um, cleaned up, it represented the women's thinking and aspiration of almost all Somali actors that existed at the time, from the die-hard communists of Siad Barre, to nationalist elements, including himself again, to the civil society at the time, or rather Hawenka, uh, or rather Bulshida, etc., Erdan, Son, Gulu to the opposition, the United Somali Congress, um, as well as to the Islamists, so it was it was one of the best constitutions. Now there was this kind of a, a, a gentleman's agreement, which was not in the constitutional document, somehow negotiated outside the process, that Siad Barre would stay on in office for another seven years. He should be somehow uh, elected, and then he would lead the country to free and fair elections. But the United Somali Congress did not want to listen to that. They went ahead with armed struggle, of course with Ethiopian help, together with the Somali Patriotic Movement and the Somali National Movement uh, from the Juba and the Hargeisa respectively. Uh, in addition, they've also continued with their political uh, wings engagements from Rome and, and across the Somali diaspora outside Somalia at the time. So, in, in fact, one main problem was the fact that the United Somali Congress, the USC, did not have any national agenda, nor a plan B or C, to come up with soon after they've kicked Siad Barre out of office. Uh, they did uproot uh, uh, you know, the whole system, state institutions and so on, and instead replaced with clan fiefdoms, and that's what we have on the ground to date, unfortunately. Um, you can you can look at the situation in Ethiopia. Siad Barre and Mengistu uh, did support various armed rebellion groups uh, on their uh, countries to get the other out of office. And it was within a span of four months or so that Siad Barre left office and then Mengistu followed. But what happened in Ethiopia is completely different from what happened in Mogadishu. The EPRD of the Ethiopian People's uh, Revolutionary Democratic Front, led by the late Meles, had its plan A's and B's and C's. 
there was there was no looting there was no rape no uh, disproportionate you know uh, killings and so on no summary executions instead they took over maintained law and order and replaced Mengistus with a new government led by Meles. Of course there was very constructive external support in terms of what they should and should not be doing, which we lacked in the Somali context. But you can see that the Ethiopians were set on what they wanted to do and had their own plans. But the USC did not have anything but get rid of Siad Barre. What next? We've been complaining of a 21 year uh, military regime but what we've replaced with that not not you and I but the USC replaced with that was a 22 year old civil militarization you know, rape which uh, you know, the, the military government uh, has never done raping a five year old uh, child it, it has never happened in Somali history uh, before the war on uh, status that we're in now uh, summary executions of that uh, level and magnitude it was it, it's just it's just uh, a tragedy you cannot erase from your mind very unfortunate okay, coming to today's uh, as a final question today's um, political arena in Somalia obviously you haven't had that 21 years behind us uh, haven't had uh, the TFG government around for a while, as long as it's lasted, with all meanings and purposes and agendas behind the, the curtains, whatever numbers the curtains may have had. Um, how much how much of that old system, the TFG system and the 21 year old world of Islam, uh, is, is replaced with this new government? I know you, you're an optimist. But how much of that is really going to uh, translate on, on the ground as an effective uh, 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 government or governing? Um, I, I think I think we're a bit fatigued, we're tired and fed up with with civil war, um, and I'm happy with what we have had on the ground uh, for the past few uh, weeks from September 10th is more of a civil society intifada, you know, an uprising that is change oriented. Uh, it's part and parcel of a 13 year plus struggle by the Somali civic movement of which you and I belong to. And I think uh, what we need to do is more optimism so that we give them a chance to test their ideas and see if they can uplift the country out of the current uh, mess. Having said that, you cannot uh, underestimate the available expertise, the qualifications, the capability, humbleness and diplomacy and tact that people like Professor Jawari and, and President Mahmoud have in terms of their either public service as well as private service uh, for the past uh, 40, you know, 20 to 40 or 50 years respectively. I, I, I think what we need to do is to be optimistic and, and very positive about development in Somalia lest it works for us rather than remain cautiously optimistic or or uh, you know, pessimistic in general. You know, if it didn't give us anything before why should we think we should keep and remain pessimistic. I think we should give them not even the benefit of doubt, but remain optimistic and give them a chance and give mediation, justice and lasting peace uh, a chance this time.